Hey everybody, this is Dean from The Wheel Dean. Thank you for coming back to my podcast. And uh, today, our guest here, his name is Rocky Stone. And uh, you're going to learn all about his life here. <laughs> so, Rocky, um, nice, you know, we, we met probably about, what, five, six months ago? Yeah, give or take. And uh, if you guys watched the previous podcast that I had, her name is Gina. Uh, we actually met at one of her gatherings at Ruby Tuesdays. So, um, it was a pretty nice gathering. We probably had about 25 people there. Oh, I'd say at least that, and, probably uh, close to 30. Yeah. You know, people with disabilities, um, I myself, spinal cord injury, uh, Rocky's a whole different story here. <laughs> uh, we actually do say, share something in common though. I did have leukemia when I was three. Um, so we are both cancer survivors, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about yours. Well, uh, God knows nobody thought I would make it to 40 years old and I just turned 40 on the 12th and uh, my dad's exposure to Agent Orange and Nam is pretty much all I have to say and all the veterans go oh man I know exactly what you're going through well not exactly but I uh, weighed 10 pounds when I was born with an enlarged heart so my mom gave birth to a watermelon and um, at 19 months they found an orange-sized medulloblastoma brain tumor developed underneath the cerebellum part of my brain. And all the years I've been explaining it, I have been misspelling this word until I actually looked it up. So, anyway. So, at 19 months, the tumor underneath the cerebellum part of my brain was causing my skull to push up to the inside of my head and crossing my eyes. And uh, my mom took me to doctors after doctors, and they said, oh, it's a virus, he'll be fine in a couple days. Well, a mother can only take so much. And so, according to her, because I was way too young to remember, she barricaded herself in a doctor's office and said, I am not going home until somebody looks at my baby. Something is wrong, I know it, blah, blah, blah. And he uh, took a pen light and shined it in my eyes, immediately ordered a CAT scan. That's when they found the tumor. What does the... Looking into the eyes, what does that mean? As far I'm as not like, sure how, what how he said. Tell? I couldn't tell you. I was I was an infant. I was 19 months old. So he is he that, seen something. I, I just I, in the pupil could have been. I don't know. I was gonna say I've heard of that as far as like, and I don't know if anybody has heard of that as far as uh, like an eye doctor uh -huh. or even people that have had pictures taken. Yeah, not the I guess yeah, like if if you've had your picture taken, and. You know, seeing red eye is no big deal, you yeah. know, reflecting, but I remember something about somebody had their picture taken, mm -hmm. and a doctor front of theirs said, you better get to the doctor, because I guess it was reflecting white. Yeah. And I have actually they, they had, had the internal pictures of my eye taken, where right. I've actually seen the printouts and the inside of the eye and all that stuff. So, anyways, that's when they found the tumor. Um, so, they performed brain surgery on me. I, my very first... Or I guess I should say second scar because of my belly button. And uh, they removed a large portion of the cerebellum and the tumor. They removed so much of my cerebellum. They gave me less than a year to live, said I would be severely retarded, a slobbering vegetable, and completely bedridden for the rest of my life. They told my parents I'd be able to move my eyes, and if they were lucky, some facial movement. They couldn't remove all of the tumor without killing me, so they stunted the growth with 7,500 rads of radiation to the back of my head and base of my spine, causing basal cell carcinoma. The most common form of, this, of skin cancer you get from the sun. In my case, I wasn't so lucky. So here it is 40 years later, and probably after New Year's, I'm going to be having my 93rd cancer surgery. Now, what, what exactly, what, what were most of the surgeries for? Skin cancer or... After the initial brain in? surgery, every single one, 99.9% uh, .9 has been for basal cell carcinoma from my waist up. And uh, the doctor... I've had a slew of doctors throughout the years. My last doctor that I had in Texas, there's a difference between a dermatologist, which is a skin doctor, and a Mohs surgeon, which cancer on top can be about the size of a... A quarter give or take but underneath it can be that big or even bigger which I brought the pictures and I left them out there he explained to me because I started getting skin cancers just below my waistline uh, my leg 
the, the crease right here and then right below it. And he said when they gave me the radiation, which is basically an X that scans your body, that the lasers point exited right there at uh, where my leg and the hip connect. That's not a fun place to have stitches. So uh, that happened at least once that I can recall, but most of the time, head, face, torso. When I was in first grade, 1985, the amount of radiation killed my pituitary gland, which is why I have such a high voice. You may or may not be able to tell, I don't know. <laughs> I've been told I have a high voice. I get called ma'am all the time when I'm on the phone, but I, I just laugh. It killed my pituitary gland and it stunted my growth. I was a full head shorter than the rest of the kids in first grade 1985. My entire neck, armpits, and belly button were so infested with basal cell carcinoma you could not touch any spot on any of those without touching cancer. Maybe prior to 1985, me starting first grade, I'm not 100% sure. The doctor at the time that I had, who was a dermatologist, come out of the operating room and told my parents, and this is hearsay stories that I've been told, he was crying. And he told my the parents... The doctor was? The doctor was. Okay. But he had been doing treatments on me ever since we moved from San Diego, California. I was born at Balboa Naval Hospital, ironically enough. So we moved to Texas, and I started going to Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth. And that's where I met Dr. Daniel Ingraham. And uh, he'd been my, my doctor up until he passed away. And he's in some of the pictures that I have. But uh, he came out of the operating room and was crying. And he was telling my parents that my cancers were growing layers upon layers. I had in excess at one time 300 plus removed. 300 plus? Cancers. Now, okay, for, for those of us who don't know, um, now you're saying layers. Layers of, let's say, like... Do they look like sunspots? Do they look like lesions um, or? What? Yeah, when when you're dealing with skin cancer, for nobody who's ever been to a dermatologist, they are called the ABCs: asymmetry, borderline, color, diameter. If any of those change, because there's a difference between cancer and a mole. A mole typically stays the same circumference. You know, it doesn't get any bigger height-wise or none of that stuff. There's also an E in the ABCs. I can't remember what it is though. But um, if any of those change, nine times out of 10, it's pretty much skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma. I mean, there have been a lot of other ones. Um, the only off spot weird one I ever had, this one right here on the back of my shoulder, yep. that was actually called squima cell. And I've heard of that. Yeah. I had never heard of that one before. Huh. And it's the only one I've ever had. Um, I have been knocked out so many times I developed an immunity where they couldn't knock me out anymore. The huh. next procedure after that is called twilight where they knock you out and if they have to ask you questions, you're still coherent enough, but you don't feel any pain. Right. And a funny story, the, the Mose doctor that I had when I, before I left Texas, they were operating on one of the sides of my head. They started talking about American Pie, the first movie, where Stifler drinks the beer with the comment. <laughs> and they were trying to think of what they called it. The doctor said, I sat up from the operating table, said it was called the Pale Ale, went back to, laid back down and went to sleep. And he, they, they were telling me that for years after that happened. And then eventually, I started developing an immunity to Twilight's. I had been pumped full, so f full of that stuff over X amount of years that I've become immune to it. Yeah. And so, the uh, I had been a guinea pig for cancer drugs for many, many years. When I was a lot younger, before my teenage years, they would take me to seminars where doctors all across the globe would come and examine me so that they would know how to treat their patients in their countries. And I, en I enjoyed that. You know, I enjoyed being the guinea pig. Well, they, they learn a lot and they could save lives. That's true. You know, and I mean, what you <clears throat> what you do for one doctor and then that doctor is basically like a branch, you know, basically yep. branches out and applies that to all the other people. Yes, yes. So that's the thing. There's, there's a lot of mentoring and things like that. 
but what what he's doing by that is helping people all around mm -hmm. and uh i know you're I, I know you're always interested in helping people oh i, I love know? telling my so, story i'll tell a stranger yeah. on the street yep and uh one of the drugs that they gave me was still in the experimental stages. It was called Tegasin. I ended up getting a toenail infection in six of my ten toes, and I had to have all uh, six of my toenails amputated because of it. And your toes are not a fun place to have needles stuck in them, too. Especially after the tourniquet <laughs> numbs it, and then the needle goes, because that's where your nerve endings are. Yeah. So that's a pain in the butt right there. Anybody who has never seen cancer underneath a microscope, the way that they tell it can, it's all removed is depending on how big the area is. If all of the outer edges are complete healthy skin, that's how they know they removed all of it. Because in my case, I have basically been the uh, recipient of somebody trying to drill for oil. Because cancer can grow down. It doesn't just grow and spread out. It goes down deep. And yeah. a lot of people with lung cancer, liver cancer, any number of cancers, that's when it spreads to other organs. So it's an unfortunate big pain in the butt. But this spot right here, I had been cut on at least two different times. The first time, he would cut a little bit, send it to the lab, and then bring me back in, numb me up, cut some more. We did not leave that hospital until after 10 o'clock at night. We were there all day long. And so, uh, in between cuts, you know, uh, they let me go, me and my folks go eat at the cafeteria or whatever the case may be. So... As he was cutting on me, I can't see what he's doing. I can yeah. only feel the pressure because uh, obviously I'm numbed up. I can't feel the cutting, but I can just feel the pressure. So I had no idea how big of a gap he had cut out of my head. So when the doctor and the nurse are bringing me down the hallway, my mom and dad are coming towards me. I, my mom's knees start buckling. She is climbing for the walls. My dad is having to hold her up. Because she saw that? Yes. Wow. The, the gap was so big, you could take this entire part of your thumb and lay it there and not touch any hair. He wow. was going to send me home that way. Huh. So when he realized my mom was freaking out, he took me back into, the, back into the operating room and pulled skin from the back of my head to cover um, as much of this as he could. You can still see a big part of it, yeah, scar so. was. But I mean, it's not near as bad as it was. Oh. And then again, in um, 2003, my right, left temple, and the back of my head were all operated on within uh, two months of each other. So as your body ages, your skin becomes more elastic. Mm -hmm. I've been stretched and pulled so many times, I don't have any loose skin left. So when he sewed all three of these up, he moved from Wolford Hall in San Antonio to, because um, he was in the Navy. Or no, Air Force. So he became civilian and moved to Arlington, Texas. So it was a lot closer towards us. When he did all three of these spots and sewed me up, within two, this is what, how I meant to say it, within a two month period, all three spots, the stitches popped. I had a busted blood vessel, a vein, and an artery all pop within two months. This one was either the vein or the vessel, the back, back of my head was either the vein or the vessel, but this right. one right here was the artery. So I wake up all three different times. I wake up and my face I'm wearing is a crimson mask. And for those of you who have never watched wrestling, a crimson mask <laughs> is blood. So anyway. Yeah. Especially with the artery. Exactly. Yeah. And we didn't know it was an artery at the time. And um, my mom would buy those big fat bl uh, towels where when you fold them over three times, they're this thick. Yeah. Yeah, this thick right here. I went through two of those from the house to the emergency room soaked in blood. Jeez. When they get me into the examination room, I, I'm wearing a white shirt, which is just covered. And I'm sitting 
uh, in the exam, not even in the examination room. I'm waiting to be seen, right. and I'm I'm just pressing this towel, and I can already feel the blood making it all the way through the top and touching my palm and all this stuff. And the reason why it took so long is for them to see me is because the only doctors that they had on call were attending to a little boy who had been bitten in the face by a dog, which okay, and I was 23, so I, you know, I didn't care. I, I, I was more concerned if they were taking care of the boy, even though I was losing blood. Mm -hmm. So they finally get me into the, uh, the examination room, and they put me on the bed. They lay a really warm blanket on me. They take two stacks of gauze pads, place them on my head, and then take those super stretchy whatevers, two of them, and wrap my head. Put me in the mm -hmm. examination room. By the time the doctors came to me, Blood made its way all the way to the top. And I'm laying on the bed, and I'm facing this way. The doctors come in around this side, and my parents are on this side. I couldn't see it, but I sure felt it. My mom said when they unwrapped my head, that blood became a geyser and shot and poured down my face and shirt. Now, here's the bastard of the situation. They didn't numb me up when they tried to close off the artery. They went in gung-ho, you know, with no numbing. Yeah. That's fire. That's... That's malpractice. Yeah. Probably my fingerprints are possibly on the rail to that, mm. to that day. The first doctor is jamming these forceps into my head while I am gritting and screaming bloody murder. And they, again, they didn't numb me up. Yeah. So he's, you know, he's... Uh, <laughs> I pardon the pun, he's basically a fat kid going after a chocolate cake and he's just jamming these in my my temple. He says, I can't get it. Drops them on my head. The other doctor grabs them, really goes to town as if he's trying to dig for oil, finally wraps the artery and gets it tied off and then they send me home. I wanted to sue that hospital for everything that they were worth. Wow. So this one popped... This one, and then the back of my head did. And my doctor ended up having to get a new phone because when we tried to contact him for this one and this one, it couldn't get, he never did get his messages. So when we, the third one finally popped, I'm asleep in bed. And anybody who has, I love peaches, anybody who has ever bitten into a peach knows exactly how this sound is. The back of my head opened up as if somebody had bitten into a juicy peach. Oh, wow. The stitches had popped for the third time. And um, I went in, same situation, woke my parents up, and, you know, we actually went to the doctor. And I explained to him uh, my dismay after I was all healed and everything yep. that I should have sued the doctors because their excuse was they couldn't numb me up for the amount of blood I was losing. The medicine would have just come out. He said, well, they could have numbed the area around it. Yeah. So... A, lo a localized thing. exactly some something <laughs> I mean just Jeez. not the way that they did it so I told him that I was gonna I was gonna sue him for everything that they were worth because I obviously had a malpractice suit and I was just trying to find an attorney at the same time still very difficult to sue a, uh, a doctor what his <laughs> suggestion was is write a letter of grievance to the board or whatever the case may be so I I never ended up suing him but the other damned of it is that happened to me in 03. I lost my mom in that hospital in 05, her mom in 08, and my dad in 11. How, how was his health and, and what, year, what age did he die at? He did two tours of Vietnam. He was in the Navy for 20 plus years. He was a chief petty officer, Boseman's mate, which I just recently found out are the same thing. I did not know that, but either way. Huh. Up until... He was a chronic camel non-filter smoker his entire life. The, it was not, he never had any cancer issues until 2008. My lower left eyelid right here, as you can see, it was the first time I had cancer develop on my lower left eyelid. So mm -hmm. they removed it. The, the same doctor, the most surgeon, Dr. Kennard, I, he was a great doctor, long 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 time doctor of mine he removed the cancer then the very next day i had to see a reconstructive surgeon who cut skin from my upper chest and made me a new eyelid right 
for many, many years, right on the outside of it was a little pink ball that about the size of a BB that I had to put ointment on even after I had fully healed for that ball to finally yeah. go away. But this this pink has, has been here ever since then. So then fast forward a couple years later, I don't remember what year this was. So fast forward a couple years later, half of my upper right eyelid had cancer on it. Same Mo surgeon, Dr. Kennard, cut half of my eyelid, which is interesting because they put eye drops in your eye that numbs the whole area but doesn't affect your eye itself. And then they put the, um, I'm not really sure what it's called. The, they lay the stuff around it for to, to catch the blood. Yeah. And then they'll, they'll clamp it to make sure it stays in place, blah, blah, blah. So half of my upper right eyelid was removed. Go to the same reconstructive surgeon. He grafts skin from the other side of my chest to make me a new upper right eyelid, as you can yep. you know, see the difference. Yeah. Um, and then... My mom passed away in 05 due to heart issues. 2008, my dad finally develops skin cancer on his upper right eyelid. Goes to the same Mo surgeon and the same reconstructive surgeon. In the time between 05 after losing my mom to 08 when he remarried my first ever stepmom, of all of the friends I had growing up, I was the only person whose parents stayed together. But, uh, you know, he, I had no problem with my stepmom whatsoever. Yeah. But uh, my dad and I had a falling out, and we didn't talk for three years from uh, 08 to 2011. And by that time, I was already out here. He passed away from stage four lung cancer in his when? early 70s. I, um, when did he start smoking? God, probably when he was in the service. Or, you know, like, teenage years, basically. Probably. Yeah. I mean, I, I had, he'd been smoking camel non-filters my entire life. Yeah, my, my grandmother smoked salmon non-filters for... <laughs> I remember man, those. Probably 60 years plus. My mom was a Raleigh 100s. <laughs> um, my mother was a salmon 200. <laughs> or no, salmon 100. But, One uh, of those, but they were... Back in the day when you could go buy him at a, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a cigarette machine. And of course, you know, that you know, <laughs> being, him being retired, you could get him a lot more at the commissary on base. Yeah. I mean, and those those were transferable. You know, you can get on one base, you can get on any of them pretty much. But um, now, you know, so, so, some people don't know what Agent Orange is. And that was how he started off here as far as... Um, his father being exposed at war to Agent Orange. So, Agent. but what I know of Agent Orange was made by Monsanto, correct? Was I, that their first, basically their chemical that they made? I had heard that before. What I honestly know of it, it's a chemical they sprayed on plants to get Charlie out of hiding. Right. I don't know if it was supposed to kill the plants. Uh, probably yeah. so. Yeah, it was supposed to basically, all, every, all the soldiers that were on the ground over in, in Vietnam, uh -huh. soldiers were on the ground and it was basically a big forest. Yeah. So they developed this chemical that they would spray from an airplane uh -huh. and basically kill, burn, burn off, not, not by fire, but basically burn all the leaves and all that stuff off the trees. So that way they can fly over and see where all the, all the soldiers are. Yep. Um, so people couldn't hide and that's where they, that's how they found them. But of course, Agent Orange, it's not only killing off the vegetation, you're inhaling it. Everybody below it's inhaling it. So yep. even the that people that were on street. boats across the water, it started floating across the water, and the yep. seamen that were on the boats um, yep. were navy. Navy is what I meant yep. to say. They were, you know, getting contracted to it too. Basically, yeah, once it rains, it's all going to run off into the pretty much into the water. When so, it rains, it pours. So yeah, you know, and obviously to this day, people are still paying for that war. Every single day of Rocky's mm -hmm. life here is, he's given a challenge every single day because of some ridiculous war that we had overseas. So when they say that we don't have a war on our homeland, <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, we do because people are still suffering from it.